Of these, about 538 were project leaders. These were people across 18 industries and all global regions. By all global regions, we mean eight regions that PMI has globally. These are North America, LATAM, Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, China, Asia Pacific. All of these different regions we covered when we were researching for this particular question of how do power skills connect to project success? And what we found out was kind of very startling to us, but in a good way, it was kind of like, you know, one of those Euro Eureka moments where we were like, oh, great. Like, this is what we've been talking about since forever. So, uh, Deepthi, if you want to move to the next slide. We had a few years ago before I was at PMI, you know, earlier during the COVID times, there was a lot of talk at PMI about what are the key drivers of project success. And the key drivers of project success were found to be 11 different things, of which the top three were BRM maturity, which is benefit realization maturity index of your organization, your organization's project management maturity. What that means is how many processes exist, what your maturity level is, do you have a portfolio plan, program management, all of those things and your organization's agility ability, like how much can you really switch and change up when you need to. And this was all assessed during COVID. So, you know, these were factors which were really like things like agility were really important during those times. And we found that power skills impact all the top three success matrix for projects. And how much do they impact? Well, for starters, Organizations that place a high priority in power scales are three times more likely to have a higher benefit realization maturity index. They're also twice more likely to have project management maturity. And they're three times more likely to be agile. And those are things that can really make a difference to how your organization runs. If you have an organization which is twice more agile than another one, that is the difference between if you're going to survive a turbulent market or not. These are really important for project and engagement success, but that is not all. We studied further and we found the, the next slide, please. We found that in the every day of the project as well, you see some really significant differences. Sure, the first thing we found that you know, organizations with higher project management priority were more likely to have their projects meet business goals. What that means is that whatever they started out to achieve, they achieved 100% or more of that. So we saw the 72% versus 65 was the number. That was okay. That wasn't the most startling bit. The second bit that became important was that organizations that place higher importance on power scales actually have less scope creep in their projects. And as project professionals, we all know how much scope creep happens and how much we really hate it. You know, when we're in the middle of a project and suddenly someone is telling you, no, we need to also do this and we need to also do that. Things you never budgeted for. So all of that was great. But the most important factor that came out was, now let's say scope creep has happened. Let's say your project is not meeting its deadline. Let's say nothing else is really working for you. You've not met your business goals as well. This project that you're working on is a real disaster. All of that said and done. Even then, we found that people whose organizations place a higher impact on power skills are less likely to lose money on that project. Because those people, those team members will have the ability to still band together and save the organization some money save the project some money, still work within a successful budget and not bleed like a lot of, you know, other situations where organizations and projects bleed money really. These were factors that really helped iron out why power skills are important for project professionals, why they're important for project success, why they're important for, you know, the engagement success with any client, with any project, with any internal client as well. I've been harping on the word power skills for a while now. What are the power skills? And what do they really mean for you, right? So we studied 13 different power skills. 
as you see on the screen, they're anywhere from innovative mindset to something as basic as communication to something as complex as for purpose orientation. For purpose orientation would be something like, do you feel like your passion is invested in the work you're doing? You know, we studied all of these 13 different power scales and we got a very interesting finding. And that finding was that globally, no matter who you are, no matter if you are in South Asia, in LATAM, in North America, in China, no matter your years of experience, no matter your industry, no matter if you are a PMP or not a PMP, no matter if you're a project leader, a CEO, if you work in agile, if you work in traditional, if you work in hybrid approaches, none of those things really matter. The top four power skills for everyone were considered the same. Everyone responded as these four communication, problem solving, collaborative leadership and strategic thinking as one of their top four power skills. Now, as you see on this global map we have here, some regions place a little more importance on something than other. Some reasons, regions feel like maybe, you know, problem solving is more important than communication. But ultimately, the top four for every region is boiling down to the same four skills. And that is the key, right? If you master these four skills, you kind of have the key. The rest of the, you know, remaining skills from the 13 skills, the rest of the nine, you can still like work around. It's great. It's all good. But like mastering the four becomes important. We're going to now take a breather for a sec and like then dive into the top four power skills. How are we doing, Deepthi? It's like we're doing great, uh, Rupal. I think I am... Uh even more excited to know more about uh, more further about these power skills and how we can improve ourselves as uh, professionals uh, being part of the profession we we really need to brush up on these skills that that means so that uh, so that we can we can become better and as you said that uh, uh, there are a lot of things that can be improved when we master these power skills right so uh, there can be lesser sco scope creep and then we can we can also control the budget also so so these things do matter a lot and i think we all need to brush up on these skills though you did mention that you you studied a lot of skills but these were the top four which came up and i'm sure whosoever is on the call will agree to me uh, agree with me that we we really need to brush up on these skills so that uh, master the skill of project management and then do wonders in our career Awesome. So I would encourage everyone to not wait for the end. If you have any questions, please pop them in the chat window. Yeah. Uh, if I see them and I can answer them at that point, I will, but I will definitely have them for the end. So if you see anything that you want to ask or talk about or even a thought you want to share, please pop it into the chat window. We want to keep engagement going. Um, Rakesh is here with me, uh, Rupal, just to let you know, in case there's any specific question, he'll pause you right there and then Perfect. we can, we can post the question. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you, Rakesh. All right. So diving into the four skills, what are they and how can you really do anything about that? First one is communication. You know, it's kind of self-explanatory, but sometimes not so much. So what matters in terms of communication is the word effective and efficient, right? If you're communicating, but whatever you're communicating and whoever you're communicating to hasn't understood what you're saying, it's not communication. Like it's very important to remember that one basic thing when we say the word communication. This can be public speaking, writing, explanation, emails, the documents you create, anything really. But making sure your message is going across to the other person, to your audience, to your team members, to larger groups in the right format is what really communication boils down to. Problem solving, again, is kind of self-explanatory, but not so much. So, you know, problem solving is something we all hear that you need to problem solve. But sometimes figuring out what is wrong is the bigger part of problem solving than just resolving the problem. If someone is giving you a question, you can solve it great. But sometimes as a project manager, you need to figure out what even the question is. What is it that you need to be asking that you're going to solve for it, right? That aspect of problem solving is something that we realized was very, very important. Collaborative leadership is another thing that became very important. Now, all of us have heard the word leadership. All of us 
us have heard the word collaboration. But when these two come together, that's where your key is. Because a lot of project managers have to lead without authority. They have they're not VPs, they're not like big shots who can just be like, you know, tell their team what to do and like the team will follow. Or no one can, you know, come back to them and like really tell them that they don't want to work on something that way or the you know, the team has a lot of other ideas. That happens to us all the time. So the ability to take in ideas from everyone, the ability to make sure every member on your team, whether it's an associate, whether it's a you know, whether it's a senior associate, whether it's a consultant, whether it's anyone really at any level is feeling like they belong in the project, that they're collaborating with everybody, that they're not just being assigned a task list, but they're actually contributing, mentally engaged. And being able to do that as a leader of your project is what collaborative leadership is about, like leading without authority, influencing the people around you to really follow what needs to happen on the project. And the last one is strategic thinking. And strategic thinking is important in a lot of different contexts. First one being being able to figure out what the alternative paths could be. You know, what, what we say as thinking on your feet, that's what strategy thinking will like ultimately boil down to. You need to be able to see patterns around you in the world, in the global economy, in a lot of different spaces and figure out what the dots are that connect, what you need to do in terms of where you are at. That is what strategy thinking boils down to. We're going to talk a little more about each of these power skills and why they are important. So moving on to the next slide. Scale of problem solving was ranked to the highest in South Asia. And when I say South Asia, we really study India as well as Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Nepal, the whole collective unit of South Asia. We found out that 76% of respondents rank this skill as number one. And it's no surprise, honestly, because problem solving is really the thing that, you know, a lot of us really run on. But we also found from a you know, recent McKinsey study that HR professionals rank this skill as one of the most important and one of the most difficult to find as well. So that makes it even more important for you as a project professional. You know, Great, you all work with amazing organizations, but ultimately when it comes to your career, having a skill that is hard to find for HR professionals is always going to give you an edge. It's always going to give you some bargaining power on the table. We also found out from a World Economic Forum research that problem solving is among the top skills that employers are seeing in rise through prominence through 2025 and beyond. What that means is skills that we know are required today versus skills we think will be required in the future. So as AI is coming into the foray, as more technology is coming into a lot of everyday tasks we do, you know, today if you give someone some work to do, there's a good chance they're going to go to chat GPT or BARD and try to figure out an easier way to do the same thing without really putting in all that, you know, manual labor. So when things like that are happening, they're going to change how your projects work, right? They're going to change what problems you're going to have. And working with those evolving problems is going to become one of the top skills in the next few years, including the next two to three immediate years as well. Hence, problem solving is something that you need to kind of master as a project professional. The second skill you need to really master is communication. And communication was ranked as most critical by 74% of respondents from South Asia. What communication really like got us was that, you know, in a Forbes study conducted recently, 89% of workers reported that ineffective communication was what was causing them problems in many different areas, including productivity, job satisfaction, trust in leadership and in teams, and in the stress levels, right? All of these things are what, you know, we all can relate. We've been all in positions where we have been in a situation where our productivity has been impacted because someone is not communicating clearly. Or our boss is sending, you know, emails to us that don't completely have all the information. 
or someone sent an email and then you know the assistant manager sent another email and there are two contradictory things and now two bosses are telling you different things you don't know what to do you don't know who to follow and to figure that out you waste like a good four or five hours on i don't know a friday afternoon and then you're kicking yourself in the gut about like why did i do this why can't i go out i want to have a good time on a friday afternoon or friday evening right so ultimately something like improper communication it starts with productivity but impacts a lot of different areas job satisfaction becomes very linked to communication because if you are frustrated in how your team your leadership is communicating you are always going to be frustrated with that job we all know people who are always bitching about their office so like you know my boss did this my team member does this no one has any direction pata nahi kya chal raha hai sare time yahi chalta rehta hai that is what we mean by job satisfaction if you if you're getting improper communication you're going to really have like poor job satisfaction we also found you know through the same study that impacts that poor communication directly impacts your stress levels and that's a no brainer right if you're getting mixed messages you don't really know what to do so you're always going to be stressed one way or another and you're not really going to be able to trust your leadership because you feel like you know i don't know what they're doing why should i trust them all of this are the soft aspects of poor communication but a recent study from shrm also showed that businesses actually suffer hard loss in terms of money because of poor communication and what that means is for a company with 1 lakh employees they are losing about 62 million dollars a year for poor communication even a company as small as 100 employees can lose up to half a million dollars because of poor communication so those things become very very important when it comes to the bottom line of a business so there's definitely a business case as well out of the you know parameters of productivity and job satisfaction for why everyone in the project space needs to work on communication next skill we have on our list is collaborative leadership and this is going to be a little interesting to talk about because it's the circus we have all been through again quite a lot so 71% of the respondents in south asia found collaborative leadership as critical we also saw that 86% of employees and executives cite lack of collaboration in their workplace as a reason for failure because you know we saw that with this fears inc study but ultimately why should you increase collaboration and why should you focus on collaborative leadership right it will all boil down to the same things we talked about in communication which is increased productivity if everyone on your team is feeling heard they're going to want to go out of the way to make things work they're going to want to go out of the way to compromise to work extra if they need to but also to be smarter about what they're doing they're going to be more invested they're going to come up with more creative solutions right so you're going to ultimately have a more engaged team you're going to have as a result of a more engaged team you're going to have a higher productivity you're going to get higher quality of work and as a result of all of those things you're going to really deliver a higher value to whoever your client is whether it's an internal client or an external client collaborative leadership is kind of like a cousin to communication everything you see doesn't work because of com- poor communication works great if you have collaborative leadership within your team last skill we're going to talk about of the four skills is strategic thinking and we saw the 70% of respondents in south asia thought that this skill was critical but we also saw in a zender folkman study strategic thinking was the top quality that separated senior management from other managers in the organization what that really means is it boils down to your personal growth right we've all been in spaces where we see certain people rise to the top very quickly they were managers then they became senior managers they became you know they they got promoted they became avps very very quickly their career trajectory is like you know 10 years and then an avp suddenly right there are other people we see who don't move at all they stay at the same level for years and years and ultimately because some organizations would have policies like up or out 
you know i know mckinsey definitely does a lot of other companies also have these policies where if you're not moving up the ladder after four years or three years or something again different companies have different policies but if you're not moving up the ladder enough in a set amount of time then they're going to ultimately fire you right so why are those people not moving up that's a good question to ask and what is it that the people moving up have People moving up usually have the ability to think strategically. They're the people who connect the dots very, very quickly. They're the people who ultimately know what's happening around them in the world, and they are able to talk about it in the meeting. You know, they're able to make those connections, you know, sitting right there. They're like, okay, this is happening there. This is happening there. We can do this. We can do that. Here's the solution that company is trying it, right? Those are the people who ultimately rise to the top. With the same technical skills, the people who don't have that strategy thinking ability are the ones who stay stagnant. They are the ones who stay stuck trying to figure out how they get from, you know, one manager position to a senior manager position. <laughs> and this is what the Zender Folkman study, you know, showed that they study 19 different leadership qualities and ultimately strategy thinking was the one that was the differentiate and so just give me one second. Uh, Rupal, why don't you take a pause? Uh, meanwhile, I'll ask people how they're feeling about the session. So, guys, what do you think about the session? Let's give two minutes pause to Rupal also. She's been talking constantly. <laughs> I hope uh, we all are learning a lot from the session and we know what skills we need to master, right? Can you let us know where you're joining in from? Yeah, that would be interesting to know where everyone is at. Yes, yeah. where have you joined in from? How uh, you would like to know? I am in Gurgaon. Do we have any other Gurgaon folks here? We have Mukul Gupta saying, oh, yeah. saying uh, I joined from Mysore Bao. Uh, Nice. Yeah, I have also logged in from Gurgaon. Yeah. There are people from Delhi. From Vishal, Sanjeev, Deshmukh, Bhupendra uh, Singh. Uh, very useful insights. Thank you, Bhupendra. Great session from Yogesh Sharma. I think people are liking it overall. Uh, GS Kutral is from Prada. Uh, uh, okay, great. I think so uh, we, we have a lot of people from... Uh, I'm not taking a blue name, so please don't mind. <laughs> so, mostly NCR folks, Ghaziabad, Delhi, Noida, Gurgaon. Yep, yep, of course. Awesome. So, it's great to have everyone. Um, I think we can resume. I'm good. Okay, great. Planet Earth, this is really interesting. Every one of us is on planet Earth from what I know so far. <laughs> <laughs> if you find someone who is not, let's maybe talk about that. That will be more interesting. <laughs> that would be interesting to know. <laughs> yep. All right. So, uh, strategy thinking, right? The question is, how do we develop these skills? And, like knowing all of those power skills is great. You like everyone said that this is great information. We need to master those skills. Great. But can you develop those skills? Does it sound like strategy thinking is something you can develop? The answer is yes. And it's a yes that we have studied. It's not an instinctual yes. We studied 14 different organizations around the globe, including Kalyani Steels and a couple of other organizations in India. But you know, some of the other organizations we studied are like IBM, Safaricom, those kinds of companies. And we found out that a lot of these companies have ways they want to develop these power skills, these soft skills for their teams. And yes, we're talking about company initiatives here. I'm also going to dive into individual initiatives a little later, but first company initiatives, right? So we saw with companies like Kalyani Steel that they have what is really called a mentorship situation. So, you know, they don't really have like what you'd call a mentorship program. It's a little more informal than that because they do it as something called coaching, but they have different levels of coaches for everything, 
like if you're a junior manager or you you know you're just an associate manager you're going to have a coach who's going to work you work with you on communication you're going to have a coach who's going to work with you on behavioral skills and who are these coaches going to be they're going to be more senior people than you right every time you get into a new team every time you go into a new project every time you're facing a challenge you're going to get a coach you can formally request a coach these coaches are going to have daily weekly monthly meetings with you they are going to review your performance they're going to work with you they're going to design a program for your individual needs right it's not a standard program that works for everyone it's not a standard oh everyone's going to tick these seven boxes and be done with it that's not what kalyani steels is doing what they're doing is they are trying to train people continuously and informally through one on one interactions other companies we saw doing something similar were ibm which has what is called a lead to influence program in some of its locations including india it has it mostly in asia pacific locations including australia india japan china korea and singapore where as you you know here in the name of the program lead to influence they teach to be leaders like people they think have leadership potential in their teams on how to become leaders they teach them you know they have like 3 hour sessions every month with each person and they teach them things like you know collaboration communication things like problem solving storytelling negotiation stakeholder management all different things are taught in those sessions to these to be leaders another one doing something very similar is safaricom from uh, niger from kenya actually nairobi kenya and they have again a very like informal environment of mentors and coaches but they also have a company wide policy of not having any meetings on fridays why because they want those fridays to be the time that the coaches spend with their mentees to really work on the skills so if your company is not providing you the time in the working hours when are you going to do it right to encourage you to work with your coaches they have told the entire company to not have any work meetings on friday only informal meetings can happen on fridays these are some really interesting concepts we saw and organizations can definitely do a lot more for you know developing power skills and project professionals but what can you as a project professional do Yeah. before we ask that propel i would uh, it would be really interesting to know from people who are on call um what their organizations are doing in order to improve learning as in uh, do they have like no friday uh, meeting policy or something like that that you just mentioned if there's anything their organizations is doing differently we would be happy to know that yeah that would be really interesting i'd love everyone to share yeah and just letting uh, you know uh, the organization where i am working at currently we have also like uh, have come up with this policy no friday meeting and uh, then we encourage learning we've logged one hour in everyone's calendar uh, friday which is dedicated to learning every friday one hour dedicated to learning and we have a learning platform wherein we we uh, we dedicatedly do learning that is great at pmi we have something very interesting so pmi like i work for the global headquarters and the global headquarters is essentially like people dialing in from 171 different countries right you don't even know where the person you're talking to really is so it's usually a madhouse but for things like these where informal coaching etc is involved you don't work with your manager but you are very strongly encouraged to find a mentor that resembles more from your background like for me i have a mentor called akshita ravi she is based out of johannesburg but the reason you know like of all the options i had the reason i picked her to be my mentor is because of her indian heritage is because i am trying to figure out how as an indian woman in the workplace whose job is primarily to talk about cultural differences 
you know a lot of the times i find myself really just talking about cultural differences about what works in europe is not going to work here what works there is not going to you know work here what is happening different you know all of those things about how do i do those things like how do i tell someone that the idea they are having is a very white people idea and it's not really been done that way in non white countries forever without offending anyone without like you know without reducing the cultural insensitivity myself right so that's something that i wanted to learn and it's a very power skill situation where you know no one can really teach you this so we have a program where we can find mentors of our own heritage and our own context like people who are lesbian people who are gay people who come from very different trans folk backgrounds or people who are neurodivergent are encouraged to find mentors aligned to their needs we have like programs for that good to know that uh, i am randomly trying to unmute someone um, cousin, okay sanjeev hi i am requesting you to unmute and if it, we could hear from you what do you think about the session and to have anything specific um, in your organization which is dedicated to learning sanjeev i'm trying to i'm requesting you to unmute but somehow You try unmuting yourself. Yeah. Hi, Sanjeev. Good to hear. Me. Hi. 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 Are you able to hear me? We can hear you, Sanjeev. Hi. Yes, the session is great. I connected from my smartphone, which uh, because from laptop I could not connect, even though I'm at home. Session is definitely great and very informative. Good to know that. Also, we would like to know that uh, if there's any particular uh, thing that your organization is doing in order to improve learning and anything like I just mentioned, Rupal mentioned that a lot of organizations are uh, dedicatedly uh, investing time to uh, learn, investing time uh, in their uh, employees so that they can learn new skills and, and then they can improve in their career. Is your organization doing something like that? Yeah, every every Friday after lunch we have a session. Mm -hmm. Okay, the topics are very general. You know, it's a sort of mentoring from mail room to board room actually. Okay, right. Come and join the conference room, and he can sit there till two hours. Okay, around five o'clock we wrap up. Uh, some learning session will be there, and some some takeaways also will be there. Okay, and people who are really interested definitely they are uh, enjoying those such uh, sessions actually. Right. Good to know that. Good to know that, Sanjeev. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that with us. Okay. With that, maybe uh, we can proceed further. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Sharing my screen. Right. So, what can you as a project professional do? So, our study, the same piece of research that I've been talking about for the last 40 something minutes, we found that project professionals, when you ask them, what are you spending your time learning? What are you spending your time training for? What are you spending your money training for? What are you asking more trainings for? Everyone seemed a little more inclined towards technical skills. We found that only 29% of people prioritize power skills versus 46% prioritized technical skills and business acumen was even further behind, right? But since we're talking about power skills, the first thing you as a project professional can do is understand that you need to bridge this gap between 29% and 46%. It's a major gap, a gap of at least 17% that and that 17% can really be a game changer for you. Even if you equate them, even if you say, I'm going to spend one hour on technical skills and one on power skills, that's a major differential. So that's where we want to begin. There's a lot more scope for em emphasis on power skill development. But what are you really going to do with your time? So, see, there's a lot that anyone can do with their time when it comes to learning power skills. So I am not going to provide you with a list of here are five steps because that's really not going to help. What we have are a few things that you can try. 
The first of those scale things that we have is a self assessment. So if you go on the power skills hub at PMI's website, you will get what is, you know, a template for self assessment, which helps you assess where you stand on power skills with that template. And then you can figure out which skill you want to develop. And that will vary for each person. So there is no one answer to it. When you go on the hub, you will also see a lot of supporting content that you will get for how do you develop this power scale or that power scale, right? According to whatever your template says. But what I am going to give you is quick on the spot, you know, scrum kind of takeaways for all the four power skills we talked about. So the first power skill we talked about was problem solving. What can you do to get better at problem solving? Very, very simple thing that you can do. And I'm going to borrow this from McKinsey because those guys have really ironed it out. So not going to reinvent the wheel. We're going to use an existing wheel. Uh, there, there's a four step method that McKinsey irons out, which is that first is you define the problem. You know, you separate the facts from opinions. You figure out what you're actually facing. You determine the process where the problem exists or the, the, the physical component where the problem exists or, you know, what is not working about the, the whole project at that point in time. You analyze different, you know, policies, procedures. Sometimes they are the problem, right? You figure out exactly what your problem is. You define it because you can't solve something you haven't clearly defined. The second thing you do is you start identifying potential solutions. You don't suddenly say, oh, here is my problem. Here is my solution. You need to take a breath and think of what all solutions could exist. For instance, you know, let's say you're having a supply chain problem of, I don't know, oil not getting through, right? One solution you might immediately have is you need more oil from a different source, but maybe that is just not possible. What are the other solutions that you can have? Maybe you can lower the cost of something else. Maybe you can bargain on something else. Maybe you can lower the cost of labor. Maybe you can uh, lower the time of transportation somehow, right? Those are many different solutions that could exist to the same problem that you defined in the first go. So take the time to identify many different solutions, even if they seem like idiotic ideas to begin with. When you evaluate each solution, and then you make a final decision. So when you're evaluating, make sure the solution you're picking not only solves the problem, but it is also acceptable to everyone on the team. You can't have a solution where you want to reduce the labor cost by paying your people less. That is not going to be, it's a solution, but it's not going to be acceptable to your team members, right? So it's not really a solution. You need to make sure that whatever you're implementing is practical. Now, one way to, let's say, reduce transportation time could be to take a flight instead of like a train, right? But it might not be practical to transport certain things to a flight. So you need to make sure your solution is evaluated for practicality, for acceptability to team members, and it fits within the policies of each organization that you're working with. Ridiculous things can happen when you look at policies. For instance, I had to wait six weeks for my laptop because according to PMI policies, you cannot get a laptop from your own country if you're working for the GHQ. So my laptop was actually hand programmed and then FedExed to me from Washington, which makes zero sense because obviously we have laptops in India, but the solution was whatever we came up with could not fit in the policies of the company I'm working with. So make sure the solutions that you're going to implement, you evaluate them against the policies of your own organization, the procedures of your own organization, maybe even run it by the legal team if you need to, you know, to make sure there are no uh, issues, run it by the ombudsman team if you need to, make sure all those things happen. Here's your fourth step to get better at problem solving. Next one we're going to tackle is communication. Now, here, I'm going to just give you three main points to start with. Make a plan, right? When you want to get better at communication, you want to communicate more effectively in your workplace. Make a plan to be more intentional about how you're going to communicate. 
by a plan i don't mean that oh i'm gonna write five emails a day that's not a plan a plan is that once a week we're gonna have a stand-up meeting on i don't know a tuesday morning and then at the end of the week i want written updates from everyone they can come in asynchronously but here is a plan an easy to remember plan two weeks two updates a week tuesday friday that's a plan make a plan to intentionally figure out what you're going to communicate and how you're going to communicate them. The second thing that will become important to making a plan is holding people accountable. So if you say someone sent this email to XYZ client, that's not going to work because everyone on the table is going to assume that someone is someone else. You need to always name a person. That X person is going to always be the person sending the email update to the client. Y person is always going to be the one assembling that update and sending it to X. And then X is going to proofread it, X is going to check it for any errors, and X is going to send it ahead. That's a plan. So whenever you're looking at communication, make a clear plan that suits your situation. Your situation could be anything. Make a plan that suits your situation. Second is create feedback loops, right? Like we said, Communication is not a one way thing. You can't just say something and then be like, you know, I don't care if the person on the other end got it or not. That's ineffective communication. So you need to make a plan to regularly check in with your stakeholders. Those stakeholders could be your clients, they could be your team members, they could be other people you're working with on the same level, you know, they could be your peers, they could even be people above you, your leaders, for instance, right? So you need to create feedback loops and regularly check in with all those people to see whatever you're communicating has actually been communicated effectively. This could look like meetings, right? A lot of the times I'm used to situations where we have a meeting and then we send notes about that meeting just to make sure everyone got exactly what we did from that meeting. It's very common. Specifically in client situations where, you know, whenever I'm working with an external client, we will send an email or they will send an email to just, uh, you know, detail everything we've discussed in the meeting. It's like a good way to create a feedback loop. Another good way to create a feedback loop is to have, you know, regular check-ins with your teammates. I have standing one-on-ones with all my teammates where once a week, even if it's for 15 minutes, we check in with everyone just to see how they're doing. Like if everything is clear, if something is bothering them about the project, if something is not working, if, if there's another colleague that's not working out for them, anything really. But creating those regular recurring feedback loops is important. And you need to meet people where they are. That is the third most important thing of communication. And this is important. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. See, um, with COVID coming in, we all are working in a very different environment right now. Right now, everyone is working in a hybrid environment. People are working like you, you're working for PMI International. So your peers might be sitting there in US and there's, uh, and you, you might not be able to meet. So, uh, how, how, how would you solve for that? By meeting, you mean, uh, meeting like, uh, uh, video calls or phone calls or something like that. Also, before you answer that, just giving you uh, a heads up on time also. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, yeah, we are very close to wrapping up. I am like five minutes away. So that's all. Good. Uh, by meeting, I mean, again, meet is a word that's flexible. It could be physically meeting. It could be digitally meeting also. Meeting someone where they are depends on where they are, right? Uh, an example could be something like meeting people in person. So we have situations where, you know, on a recurring basis, the team is flown around for retreats where everyone gets together because you've never met those people. You need to see them physically, right? So the you, you as a manager are making that happen for your team. The other meeting someone where they are can also be that, hey, I don't want 10 meetings on my calendar every day. Can we reduce some of them? Maybe some of these meetings could be emails instead. That is also meeting people where they are. It could be more, it could be less. Assess what your team needs. Assess if they communicate better on calls, texts, emails, whatever, asynchronous communication. Whatever works better for your teammates is what you as a project leader and project manager need to provide. 
Does that answer your question, Deepthi? It does. Thank you. Thank you, Rupal. Awesome. So uh, we, we have one more uh, question from Razakur. Uh, so he's saying, I'm planning uh, also accountable and measuring results because my project scope doesn't allow me to give accountability to other. I do have subordinates. Feedback loop is always followed and then uh, you know, finally done. So it's kind of a vague question uh, a bit there, but uh, you want to add something to this? I think what he's trying to ask, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that how does he give accountability to others? So the quick answer to that is you don't always have to give accountability to others. If your project scope doesn't allow you to give accountability, it doesn't allow you to give accountability. You then give responsibility. You can give responsibility without the accountability. You can still have your head on the chopping block, but someone else doing the actual work. Does that make some sense? Uh, yeah, it does. And uh, I think he, he didn't have really had a question, but uh, yeah, yeah, he was mentioning that. But absolutely, man, the, the responsibility goes that way. Thank you. Great. Yes. All right. Awesome. So yeah. the last two things before we close up on how you work on collaborative leadership and then strategic thinking. So collaborative leadership boils down to two things, building trust and influencing without authority. Like we said, you have to often influence without authority. You need to connect with your team members when you know you have to build a place of psychological safety. And by that, I mean, you need to go out of your way to make sure people are feeling heard, to make sure people are feeling that they can trust you, right? Build that psychological safety. As Break the silos that exist within your teams. Make sure people are talking to each other. Make sure everyone knows what the shared goals are. Make sure you're always open and all your teammates are always open to new crazy wacko ideas of solving something, right? Those are some things you can try to start building collaborative leadership. Moving on to the next one, which is strategic thinking. This is a slightly difficult one to build because it involves getting out of your bubble. But the one answer I got from everyone I spoke to about it was read, 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 read. Read books, read news, find out what's happening around you. Develop that strategic foresight, you know, to figure out what's happening in the world. Develop an inquisitive mind. Always ask questions. Why does it work like this in Singapore? Why does it work like there? Why do they not have big cars? I don't know here. You know, why, why, why is this not available in the hills? Why can't you send some vehicle somewhere, right, to do something, or like just always have an inquisitive mind. Even something as simple as like, how does an airport work? When you're at an airport, all of you travel a lot, I'm sure, right? So having that inquisitive mind will always make you question things. And if you question things, you're gonna seek out that information, you're gonna Google, you're gonna read online. Read doesn't just have to be in the form of a book. It can also be YouTube videos. It can be anything you really want, but Cultivate that inquisitive mindset. Have a bit of a flexible attitude in the sense that be open to new ideas that you did not think of before. You know, as you do more of that, you will develop an ability to connect the dots. You will develop an ability to understand that, okay, I saw in the news that the Panama Canal is blocked. Maybe that is why the shipping issue is happening. Maybe that is why something is costing extra. Right? When you develop that ability to connect the dots, to contextualize information, you see every dot not as a dot, but a dot with a lot of collection of different dots behind them. And as soon as you can do that, you have strategic thinking because then, you know, you can figure out, oh, I hop from here to there to there to there, there, and then my problem is solved. So having that strategic thinking ability is something that requires a lot of working on, but essentially the takeaway for that is always read more, be more inquisitive. Few takeaways for everyone that we shared were great, but I'm gonna just close this particular session with at least my part of it, with how do you make a plan to build power skills? First thing we did today was understand the connection between engagement, success, and power skills, like why you need power skills. The second thing which you need to do is you need to go and evaluate your role 
with respect to your organization's needs and identify what power skills you need to develop. You can use the template we have at the PMI Hub for that, but you can also just talk to people around you, talk to your managers, talk to your team, figure out, maybe they'll tell you you're better at communication. You don't need to develop communication. Maybe someone will tell you, oh, you have great strategic insight, but you don't know how to communicate your strategic insight, right? So you need to evaluate where you are, what your role needs and what the gap is. Once you have clarity on that gap, you can focus on developing that particular power scale or those power skills in focus. And that's really the basic answer to it all. On the next page, we have the link to the power skills hub, which is pmi.org forward slash power skills. You are going to find all of this research there as well as a template to assess yourself. Well, Rupal, thank you so much for the session. And guys, as Rupal said, that you can go to this link. You will be able to uh, explore these skills. You will be able to know more about these skills. And then you will also find a template to assess yourself on these power skills. Rupal, that was very, very informative se session. We not only learned about the power skills, what power skills are, and uh, uh, we also got to know that how to master those power skills. So you you actually uh, uh, told how we can master each and every power skills. Uh, sorry, <clears throat> the four power skills that uh, you did mention that these are the key power skills that everyone needs to master specifically in our profession. Uh, you you actually broke that down further and explained how to master those power skills. And I'm sure each one uh, of us who's part of the session will be. Uh, it's going to be very, very helpful to us. And I'm sure we are going to go to this link, pmi.org, power skills, and going to assess ourselves on those power skills. And I'm sure all of us are going to get benefited out of it. Thank you so much again for your time and then sharing your research with all of us. Uh, for everyone, uh, this was the first session of the series wherein we were bringing the research directly from PMI International to all of us. Uh, we're going to have more of these sessions in future. And uh, Rupal, we, we might trouble you maybe in future for more such sessions so that we can bring this research to all the people here at PMI North India chapter as well. This session was very, very informative, and I'm sure all of us are going to get benefited out of it. And we, we really look forward to more such sessions in futures when when uh, in future, if you uh, as an I'll I'll definitely be in touch with you. If you have done more such kind of research in future, I'll definitely be uh, pestering you and will be uh, checking uh, checking on you that if there's something that you can share with, with all of us, that would be great. Thank you again for your time and for everyone who's uh, who's there on the session. What you can do is you can claim one PDU code out of this training that you've recently uh, you've just now had from Drupal. So what you need to do is you need to go to CCRS dashboard at PMI. You uh, click on report PDUs, click on course or training. The course provider name would be PMI North India chapter. Course name would be learning by three power skills project management professionals and your PDU claim ID is C1188RH4JP and the date start date and end date of this course would be today's date which is 2nd of July and uh, you'll get one PDU under talent triangle ways of working and in case you have any questions you can reach out to me or Vikas Madan. With that I would like to thank uh, Rupal again, a big thank you to Rupal for sharing this research with us. And I would like to thank everyone who's part of this call for being here on a Sunday morning and uh, uh, be present on this uh, call and then uh, spending time on learning. That me, Deepti Sehjpal Gauri signing off. Any final comments from you, Rupal, before we sign off? Just a huge thank you to everyone who made it here on a Sunday morning. Thank you so much for your time. And this has been great. Thank you for organizing this deep team. I, uh, it's our pleasure. Everyone at uh, PMI North India chapter is very thankful to you, Rupal, for being here and then uh, sharing your research with each one of us.
and as i said i will be in touch with you for uh, future sessions as well maybe in future a few months down the line we can have one more session where you share further research with all of us thank you again and uh, i deepthi sahpal gori thank each one of you uh, from pmi north india chapter and we'll see you soon uh, we are planning to host another session on 30th of july another session it won't be a research session from pmi international but you'll you'll hear from us uh, we'll be dropping an email to everyone and we'll be posting the details on social media channels as well uh, regarding that session so stay tuned uh, for more updates and please follow uh, pmi north india chapters linkedin page in case you're not following and we'll be posting all the details over there thank you everyone thank you have a good day take care bye um